I'm happiest in the saddle. <laughs> a fellow sportsman. I am an FBI agent. Great Scott. What do you say we cut the chit chat? A hole. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Come with me if you want to live. Hello, and welcome to the Retro Ramble podcast. I'm Charlie McGee. I'm George McGee. And this time we're covering Willow. We are covering Willow from 1988. George, you gave us this bad boy. Well, it is a George Lucas production, but it is directed by Mr. Ron Howard. That is insane. I didn't know these two worked together. Is it the first and last time they would work together? No, no, they've worked together before this, which I'll go on to explaining. Okay, it, I'm sure it's probably obvious, uh, but no, yeah. Um, Ron Howard is actually Chewbacca. <laughs> I believe, I, I believe. So uh, what can what can people expect to hear today? We're going back to 1988. There's going to be some nice haircuts. Regardless of, of it being a period piece, there's still going to be things that stink of 80s. Uh, but we've got Val Kilmer. We've got... Um, who else have we got? We, we have uh, Joanne Wally, who would become Joanne Wally Kilmer after this film. Uh, we have Warwick Davis. So, of uh, he the, of R two D two fame. Well, he wasn't R two D two. He was Wicket. He was the, one of the Ewoks originally. Claim to fame. Okay. And then he would go on to being in lots of the Harry Potters in various roles uh, in Harry Potter. So yes, this is but this is his first sort of big on-screen role. His breakout breakout role. Mm. Okay, so um, it's a Ron Howard film. Uh, we love Ron Howard. Who doesn't? Even Homer Simpson loves Ron. Howard. Well, you say that he's kind of in a bit of trouble, hot water at the minute. But uh, that's that's a different story. Okay, we ha- we haven't got time for a new section today. Okay, yeah. so we're going back to 19, ni- uh, 1988, not 1990 yet. Uh, Ron Howard, George Lucas has got his fingerprints all over this. Um, but it was Willow. I, I'd like to I think I saw this at the cinema. I, I, I felt like that big of a deal coming out. Did Can you remember? Did you see this at the cinema? Well, we'll get into that in, in first okay, memories. Okay. But I'll, we'll read, d- I'll read. So is the trailer good to go? I mean, do we need to do a disclaimer at this stage? If you're listening to this podcast, George and I are brothers. We're reviewing the films we, we grew up with, with a similar mentality to the age we were. Uh, what else could we say, George? It's a light-hearted uh, look back at, at the films of our youth. So it, it, whilst it is a, a, a look back and we look into the, how the film was made, We'll do a, a review of the film, so there will be spoilers throughout. Uh, as Charlie says, you know, we we have a, a slightly childish approach to it, so there will probably be some bad impressions, as you've already heard, and maybe some colourful language. So just be mindful if you have children listening to this. I like your small people with tiny minds. Yeah, I just feel a bit conscious talking about it in in this episode because we're talking about little people, oh, as shit. in yeah, little it's people. Yeah, little, little people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, I guess I guess we'll get to that. Okay. So, without further ado, um, here it is: Willow, nineteen eighty-eight. Hit the trailer, George. It was a different time. It was a time of destiny. A time when a child could tip the balance between good and evil. Why, with my powers, with the strength of my great army, can you not find one little child? A time for an unlikely hero named Willow. Tell her I'm not going to let anything happen to the baby. you got to give that baby to somebody. I'm somebody. A time of scoundrels. What goes on here? Uh Uh-oh. And a time of rebels. You are great. It was a time when courage could be found where you'd least expect it. A time when unearthly powers raged and good men risked their lives. A time of great adventure.
from the creator of Star Wars and the director of Cocoon, Willow. So, George, how did we get this 1988 Howard Lucas joint? From whose noggin did this come from? I mean, I said in the intro, you can see that George Lucas's fingerprints are over this creatively for good and for bad. But how did we get this film? How did these two end up working together on this project? So, yes, it starts with George Lucas uh, all the way back in 1972. So even before he hit big with Star Wars, he came up with the idea for the film originally uh, titled back then as Munchkins. (laughs) Uh, However, he sat on the idea for for quite some time and obviously got uh, very as hands full with Star Wars and and all the Star Wars sequels, just the uh, the original trilogy we're talking about at this part. However, he formed a relationship with Ron Howard on American Graffiti. I think it was it that was his the big film he did uh, prior to Star Wars. So that was mid seventies. And as a lot of people know, Ron Howard was you know in Happy Days, but I think American Graffiti was uh, for after his time on on Happy Days, but. Following them working together on American Graffiti, they stayed in touch. They stayed good friends. And Ron Howard would then go on to become a a fairly successful director of, of, uh, I wouldn't say blockbusters, but I think his breakout uh, directorial debut maybe was Splash. And then he did Cocoon. And whilst he was overseeing the post-production on Cocoon, uh, ILM, owned by George Lucas for doing the special effects for it. And whilst he was at ILM, they got chatting and he and Ron Howard was like, oh, yeah, I, I really love to do a fantasy project at some point. And, and George Lucas, as I'm imagining, was was stroking his beard. And he was like, yeah, well, maybe, maybe I got something for you. Yeah. I'm trying to work out what's, what George Lucas was up to. So this was 1985. Return of the Jedi was 1983. So I don't know if he had his hands full with ILM. Rolling about a bed of money. <laughs> Possibly, but um, he, yeah, so he like, gave it to Ron Howard. And was like, you run with it. Um, you find a writer. So uh, Ron Howard found uh, a guy he'd worked with previously, a guy called Bob Dolman, who mainly had TV credits to his name. But Lucas was a, f- a fan of his work he did on a sitcom uh, called WKRP in Cincinnati, which was in the late 70s. So, yeah, he did, I think, seven drafts uh, in in a year, and Lucas was happy with it. However, when it came to selling the film, you would kind of think with George Lucas's name and the success of Star Wars, it would be an easy sell, right, to the studio? Right. Wrong. So it's probably worth noting, so you and I, I think it's safe to say, we're not massive fantasy fans. Safe to admit that? Yeah, I think our, our our interest in fantasy begins and ends with Lord of the Rings, and even the stuff in that that we're not really aligned with. Yes, I was going to say the same thing. I think you know, you and I were big fans of the Lord of the Rings films. We grew up watching the very scary Ralph Bashke animated one that finishes halfway through the story. Do you remember Dungeon, that? Dungeon, yeah, yeah, it's halfway through the second one. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons was a cool cartoon when I was growing up, but never ever played the game. And then what would the other sort of anything other fantasy really in our realm? I well, think, there's, kind of, there's Labyrinth. Labyrinth was not was more like, I don't know, it was more like comedy horror. I wouldn't say that was fantasy. but Well, yeah, the 80s was a big time for fantasy. And I don't know why it was so in vogue. But the, yeah, there was a lot of fantasy films in early 80s. So, yeah, Labyrinth was one of them. That was 85 there was Legend, you know, Ridley Scott, Tom haven't Cruise. Haven't seen that. Haven't watched that. That might be one for Revelations because I don't think I've watched it all properly. So I've, maybe. Do you know what I haven't watched as well? Is uh, Never Ending Story. Never watched it. That's that's fantasy. I just think the concept of the title it terrifies me. It's, so I think it's, that's why it's, I, I never got round to watching it. Mrs. Simpson, this is the biggest crime against <laughs> my case against the makers of the Never Ending Story. There was Kroll. There was Dragon Slayer, Time Bandits, uh, Lady Hawk. There was there was lots of fantasy films in the eighties. And now a lot of 
Potter. No, no, but it's uh, a lot of them weren't successful. And for that reason, when even with George Lucas's name and backing behind it, they, a lot of the studios were like, we don't want to touch fantasy. You know, it's it's not yeah. people are, you know, it's not bringing in, in the big bucks. But Masters I, of the Universe changed all that. Is that what you're about to tell me? <laughs> that was 87. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Of course, that was 87. That was probably another reason why people didn't want another fantasy film. Uh, however, George Lucas took it to uh, an old friend that had, uh, I think it was Alan Ladd, who had originally bankrolled uh, Star Wars. He was now at a different studio. And he, because he goes back with Lucas, he was like, yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll bankroll it. So there you have it. So they, they, they got the ball rolling. Filming locations, uh, like with Star Wars, are filmed at Elstree in London. They also filmed a lot in Wales, actually, in a, in a disused uh, quarry in Wales. And then I think for a lot of the snow scenes and mountain scenes, that was in New Zealand. Right. Wow, that's quite quite a trip, though. Yeah, so it, well, I think it was because it, the time of year they were filming in England, the only place that had snow at in the filming schedule was New Zealand. That's why they didn't do the Alps why, or, why did, or North I, America. I, I, when I was watching, I, I did ask myself, where has this been filmed? It was like quite cinematic. And yes, I mean, no, I, I find that interesting about the production side. So, you know, just to go back on your point. So th- was this or wasn't it a success at the cinema? This was a, a moderate success. Uh, I, I don't think it was the big success that George Lucas had envisioned. And I think a lot of people, again, assumed because it was the George Lucas thing, it was going to be, whether it was hyped up to be the next Star Wars. Yeah. So I think it did all right. I think it, you know, it made three times its... Well, we uh, watched it. And this was back in the day where we either paid to watch it in a rental, we paid for the video itself, or we paid to watch it at the cinema, or Telestral TV paid him. So you, do you know what I mean? This was back in the day when if lots of people watched the film, the, the film made money. And what we'll get on to talk about later is they're making a remake, a remaking, they're remaking a series, aren't they? So Yes, a re a reboot call series, let's call it that. Yeah, but there you go. It's like there's obviously been a conversation. They're like, well, we should do something in fantasy and it should be like this, this, and so well, we've got this Willow property. Why not develop? Well, well it's hilarious. I, I was watching a trailer for it, one of the original trailers. No, no, it was the the making of, and I'll have to send it to you and we might have to feature it because the opening 30 seconds, it's like in a time of, of endless sequels with a number at the end and unoriginal properties comes a brand new original idea from George Lucas. And I'm just like... Uh, that's funny how, you know, you can't apply that to uh, <laughs> it now. You can't just put Roman numerals after a film and expect it to be a success. <laughs> so, yeah, should we should we just jump into the film? So, yeah, in terms of first memories, I, I do remember us all watching this, our, our group of friends that we, we always bang on about, the Glendinnings, the Feenies. I remember, I remember us watching it all together on video. Whether we, I, I was just I was trying to. I do remember this being a film that we all watched, and it was a big deal. Probably because you joke about the maybe the George Lucas connection wasn't enough to get bums on seats in the cinema, but it was enough for for this film to mean something to us when we were growing up. Well, I mean, yeah. Let's let's uh, address the the dragon in the room. I remember us joking about it when we were kids, saying it was a Star Wars ripoff. The fact that you have. Mad Mardican is essentially, you know, a, a medieval Han Solo. You have instead Princess of, Leia. Y- yeah, you've got a warrior princess. Darth Vader, Darth you, Vader is replaced by her mom. Yeah, no, no, you've got General Kale, who's yeah, basically the guy with the skull oh, they mean mask. The, skele- the skull mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's He's that's basically that, Darth Vader. And then you have Lady Palpatine, Queen yeah. Queen Bav Morda, is it? Yeah. So. And and then well, I didn't really sort of draw the connection, but I saw somebody else mentioned that the the brownies, the two mid uh, two pixie guys, are the effectively yeah they're eff- uh, effectively the the C three PO and R two D two of the piece. Yeah, yeah, no, that that, that kind of makes sense. But mm. it's I, I the one I said before, you know, it's got George Lucas's fingerprints all over it. He's like, I'll just do the same thing again. But I, I'd like to think it's more than him just saying. 
I just think I, I can't stop thinking of Ron Howard and the Simpsons like, and he has to decide who will live or die. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I get this, I have this idea of Ron Howard pitching the film to Lucas and going, okay, so yeah, he could be Han Solo, that could be the Leia character, that could be Vader. Yeah, I could work with this. Do you know what I mean? I it's it can't have been that basic, but it's funny. Yeah. It's like, was it deliberate? Was it accidental? I, do you know what I mean? It's like, it must, it, or is it just his style? It just seems weird to me. It's so blatant. But at the same time, you can say there's there's definite parallels with, with Lord of the Rings, you know. Oh, God, uh, it's a hobbit much? Yeah, little, little person entrusted with, you know, big responsibility, going outside his comfort zone. In a village of other little people. Yeah. With funny names, you know. And uh, in and where humans are in it, so it's a world where there's little people and humans exist, and they're referred to as giants. It's like, oh no, the baby's this. So can I? I mean, we've done first memories, George, but I, I thought just as a segue to get us talking about this film, is the many firsts that feature in this film, just to give you a, a, a taste of what I would like to discuss today. So, first time I've seen a wig on a baby. First time I've seen a costume on a dog. Uh, what do you mean? They they were they were rat hounds, weren't they? Yeah. Instead of dressing up a monkey, Charlie, it's dressing up a dog. Yeah. So first time I've seen a granny fight. So I, I just think baby wigs, dog costumes, and granny fights. Not seen that in a lot of films before, but Willow gave us all three. No. So where do you start talking about this film? It's it's a great romp. It's a great you know you talk about it as being fancy. It's solid. It ticks a lot of boxes. You know it's. Um, Watching it again, I'm like, I can see why we liked this when we were young. It's a, I guess you would say it's like a, a, a young adult, a young adult film at best. It's a Harry Potter type film. It's not there for adults. It's there at the best. It's there for adults who take their kids to see it. Yeah, and, and I think George Lucas was, again, quite clear on that when he was devising it. He said he wanted a, a like a, a fantasy film for a young audience. And it was like something very corporate. He said it's sort of like a bunch of, encounters manufactured for a young audience it's like that sounds very corporate speak for <laughs> creating a film let's make some money yeah I, I think it's it is um it's there's a lot to like about this film it's got a great school by james horner as we've talked about you know some of the locations it's got some beautiful cinematography and some great use of matte paintings for, for... yeah i noticed that when they're climbing up the hill and in the background yeah very, yeah very smart use of that and I think, yeah, from from the key players, you you get some great performances. I think for for Warwick Davis, considering you know it's he hasn't had that much acting experience. You know, he was under <laughs> lots of fur in Return of the Jedi. Uh, I think he does very well for a, effectively a first time leading performance. I think his accent's a bit weird, considering he's English. There's times where it feels like he's had an American a- accent coach. Yeah, or maybe he's just lived. He was living in LA, you know. I maybe think probably, I think it's more that in Hollywood. Yeah. No, but then you you see like in the behind the scenes f- footage, he's talking in his English voice. So I don't know whether or whether that's a Ron Howard thing, whether he's been told to give it a more of a generic accent. Or to I think say certain things that the American audience won't miss. Maybe, they yeah. Wouldn't, I wouldn't say dumbing it down, but like, look, you know, our big audience is US. When you say this with your English accent, I feel like we lose something. So I need Mm. you to say it a bit more American. Yeah. That sounds like the sort of thing a director would say. And you've got a great performance from from Val Kilmer. I think, you know, he's he's got that, yes, it is Han Solo light, but it's 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 a very charming performance. He's does that lovable rogue and a bit of a clumsy oaf very well. I, I also like that he's wearing what should mostly be described as I've just left a Skid Row concert. You know, it's just like, it's like that sort of metal thing, but he's, you know, he's tall, he's dashing, he's handsome. And that's, that's just, that's just Val Kilmer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's the whole brownies thing. There's the wiz. I mean, do, should we, I don't think the plot is worth dissecting. It's pretty much the, by the numbers fantasy, right? The only thing I would say is, sort of to jump into the the negatives i feel like it does jump around a bit and then and in some ways i kind of the the time time the passage of time isn't very clear so for example willow gives the baby to mad Mardican and then sets off home and then very quickly mad Mardican's already lost it and the brownies have kidnapped her with the, their eagle it's type the thing. next scene it's, it's the, the next ne- scene yeah they like part they part ways and then 
maybe we see something happening with the evil queen and then it goes back to him and the brownies i've got your baby and he's yeah, like I've got the baby. Want, yeah so yeah okay. so yeah so, so there's that and then the next time we see my mardigan he's in a tavern sleeping with someone's wife dressed as a woman so i'm like okay how long has this been what's going on <laughs> yeah he's, so he's, he, he can't be trusted so yeah, I I don't know if there is some some missing scenes or they're just like yeah this is fine and it does zip along you know I do I I think it was very you're never bored and I I think it it does it does have a good pace to it but thinking back I was like oh yeah that's a little bit choppy and and the timelines don't and I I don't honestly know I saw someone ask on IMDb is like how long is Willow away for and someone's like oh a week and I was like I'm sure it feels longer than that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is hard to pinpoint, but don't worry about that. Don't uh, worry I about think it. there was a few things in this film. Like, oh, yeah, don't worry about that. It's like, um, I, th- I thought it was interesting that, you know, you're talking about the Star Wars similarities, that whole rigmarole that Willow has to go through to turn the super powerful Yoda, sorry, not Yoda, the super powerful naked granny. It's kind of like Jedi training. It's like, yeah, no, do this. Do, oh, you're almost getting it. You're almost getting it. It's almost like you're only going to get it in time for Act Three. <laughs> you know, well, that's like, it. So, so effectively, we Charlie... were, dissect, we're, di- we're dissecting it, but there is there are some massive similarities with the Star Wars structure. You have effectively two sort of Obi Wan's because let's not forget, Charlie. You have the head magician in the village at the start. And... Real dog. Did you say Quildor? Quildor. I can't believe we're talking about Masters of the Universe twice in the same episode, but this was 987. We are in fantasy, and some actor just couldn't get enough work, it would seem. This guy. But but I uh, think it's great to see him without all the ton of prosthetics on. Is it, you know, to see him actually expressing with his proper face. That He's is got him. A... It wasn't ADR. It wasn't. No, no, it's it, it, it's the same. It's Billy Barty. It's the same guy. Okay. Yeah, I want to see more stuff of him, and he's hilarious. No, he's got a great um, little twinkle in his eye, and I think he's he's. That's the thing I was going to go on to say. I think whilst the main players are, are good performances on the whole, I think because I think at the time it was one of the biggest collection of little people, like in terms I was of say, you keep saying biggest, George. I, I think you've got to be, you know, you've got to be sensitive about this. So yeah, that that whole village or party scene, I think, was it like two hundred and fifty little people, and they assembled it like you know from all over. I think the UK, and it was like the biggest collection for a for a film or TV set. But I think yes, yeah, some of the the trope that leave the, uh, Willow's village are a little bit ropey at the acting. It's a little bit OTT, a little bit panto. I was going to say that's the only thing that jive with me watching this again. And even I would accuse Warwick of that a little bit, or maybe it's the ch- child actors he's working with. Well, he was but, only he was only seventeen when he did. But this. it's just like it doesn't matter. It's that's why I kept saying to myself, it's for kids. We lapped it up back then. But yeah, there there is some, but we are really dissecting it now. So we've talked about uh, some of the good, some of the bad. What else should we talk about? Should we talk about the villain or the villains? Is that a guy from Never Say Never Again? Yeah, so we have, we have, so you've got two, two people from Never Say Never Again. So you have General Kale, the man with the skull mask. That is Pat Roach, who is a legendary stuntman. So he's the bald Nazi that Indy fights on uh, in front of the plane in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Really? Same guy. And he's also the guy that Connery fights in the, the health club, in the gym. Oh, in, no, so it is the guy in, I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, was he, he was Mr. Superman or Super whatever, Mr. Universe for the UK one year. That's what the, the joke, what, well, uh, maybe I'm remembering this wrong, but that was the the in-joke about the Bond fight, is that Connery, whatever title Connery oh, he, used to have, he this used to guy was universe, that yeah. was either used to be, you know, when they have that fight, that's a great fight. It just The guy can't be stopped until he obviously meets his end, thanks to Connery's mm. urine. Anyway. <laughs> we'll cover that later yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> in, a f- in a few months but the other person from never say never again is it's that guy it's uh it's, it's guy- my eye don't get it- smoking gets in jack's eye yeah it's <laughs> jack patachi it's yes it's uh gavan O'Harely. uh so yeah jack patachi from never say never again also the villainous brad from superman 3 he was that was shit. the other 
I was going to say, yeah, because you've just now, do you know what music's just playing in my head? It's that music that, that Fatima Blush plays, you know, in a car. Goodbye, yeah. darling. Yeah, just that, <laughs> just that. You've started that ah. muscle memory. God, it's how long is it until we do Never Say Never Again? Well, we're going to oh do God. it next year. We're going to do, oh my ne- God. We're going to do Never Say Never Again versus Octopussy because they're both made the same year, 1983. Oh, okay. So yeah, 40 year, 40 year anniversary. So yeah, you've got well, that. We're basically going to spend two hours talking about Maximilian, aren't we? Maximilian yeah, Ma- Ma- yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much about so, five minutes so, on, on Octopussy. And we're back in the room. Okay, so Willow. Oh yeah, we're talking about Willow. I think it's got some, at the time, groundbreaking special effects. They go so, nuts, don't they, when they're churning that wizard? Okay, I'm going to turn you into a duck. You can obviously see the ILM and everything. They were really flexing their muscles at this point. Yeah, so uh, I've just recently watched on on Disney Plus. There's a fantastic uh, six part documentary series called Light and Magic, and it's it's charting. I've seen the, it. Have you watched watched it, or have you just seen it on Disney? No, I mean I've just seen it on Disney. Okay. <laughs> It is a bit geeky, but yeah, it's the, all about the creation of ILM and how it, George Lucas created it specially for Star Wars. And then once Star Wars wrapped, it was like, well, we need to keep the company going. What what work do your mates have? And then it was like, once Spielberg used them, it was like, okay, what? how do we get out into the industry? And it's really, really interesting. And then it, it talks about the transition from stop motion and model making to cgi and how some of the guys that were working for them for years felt like kind of phased out because they're like oh yeah we can just do that in a computer and they're like but put my models <laughs> um yeah. but yeah obviously this was uh a peak time uh f- for their special effects and yeah as you say that transformation uh sequence with the 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 wizard is it Ra- Ra- razel so yeah, that was a a groundbreaking technique. So uh, Dennis Murin, he considered trying to do it with stop motion and animation and doing cutaways. So a bit like they did in American Werewolf. So you're yeah you're progressing you and just keep just, adding stuff. Yeah, and to give that illusion and cutting away at the right moment, they were going to do that, and he just thought it was going to be too technically challenging. So. They started about, okay, well, how can we look at doing morphing the photo in a computer? And they spent six months writing this new software, which essentially, yeah, took, they filmed each animal and the actress doubling for, for, uh, for Razelle. And then they fed it into this computer program, which would create a smooth transition between the, the each stage. And obviously they would go on to use it for um Last Crusade. I think, you know, with um when the guy drinks from the, the cup and he turns into the skeleton. So yeah. they did that that transition. And then it would also go on to it be, you know, paved the way for Terminator 2 for some of the, the T one thousand stuff. That's nuts. And it is it's amazing how like you forget, I can remember being around at Jamie Feeney's and him showing on his, I don't know if it was a Mac or I don't think it was the Amiga, but it was some sort of painting program. And he showed his skills as an artist drawing cartoons and stuff. But he did this thing where he took a face of a lion and the face, another face, and it blended them together. It like went from one to the other. And I'm talking, it, this was like 1990. And I was like, wow. Yeah. You know, it was like, so yeah. it's funny to think where, how far things have come to, the stage now when Marvel are making a film, they've got like server farms of like, you know, they've got data centers like churning over things to produce the graphics required in like the recent Spider-Man films and stuff and the Doctor Strange, the stuff that just looks nuts. They've got like the amount of processing power they've got to make these graphics is nuts. You know, well, so. the, f- the fact that now on a typical film, they have to employ multiple VFX houses to to do it, just whereas to manage, yeah, yeah just yeah. to manage the the amount of work. But back then, it was just one ILM would do it for the for an entire film. Uh, ILM also do um, you know to talk about stop motion, um, stop motion legend Phil Tippett, the you know the dinosaur supervisor on Jurassic Park. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so he did all the stop motion for that two headed dragon thing. Yeah, uh, that, that oh, I've got some some trivia on that. So. That dragon is called uh, uh, Ebor Sisk. It's a mixture of Siskel and Ebert. So, because apparently, as a bit of a critics, a t- the critics, yeah, the two tr- critics, and General Kale is named after a very famous film critic called Pauline Kale, who 
uh, frequently gave George Lucas bad reviews. So oh, I love it. Um, in, your, in your face. <laughs> yeah. And unsurprisingly, she didn't give this film a good review. <laughs> wow. I, I, I'm so, I, I think I, I don't know why Ebert would have a problem. I guess he maybe he's just not a fantasy fan because I've seen him. I've seen Roger Ebert review like a film with Schwarzenegger and say, if you enjoy his films, you will, you know, he, you'll enjoy this film. It's predictable. It's blah, blah, blah. So he, but he can, he can still, he can still see the good in most things. So it's surprising if Ebert had a problem with, uh, with maybe it was, uh, I don't know if, if Ebert had a problem with all of Lucas's films. Maybe it was just a, a, a playful nudge towards them because they were big critics at the time. Yeah. But he okay. definitely had, he definitely had an axe to grind with Pauline Kale. Well, it, it seems that way. I did like that character, the the, uh, the, the skull guy. I thought he. Was yeah, good. no, I th- I think you know even uh, Jean Marsh as 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 Lady Palpatine. I mean, Bav Morda. I think it's it's a good performance. You know, with the material she's got, she's suitably like vexed and evil and hissing and English uh, English villain accent type. And thing and she's going prop, proper Palpatine by the end with the like swollen <laughs> eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and as you say, uh, as uh, you were saying at the start, I found it a bit odd. The climax of the film is two grannies beating the shit out of each other. Granny fight, and it's a proper fight. This oh, it's a fist fight, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like no, but I said to you, like as as well as the baby wig, it's like we need to reinforce the fact that the baby has ginger hair. Well, she hasn't got any hair. It's a baby. Put a wig on it. I don't In understand. Fact, put wigs don't on understand. all of them. Yeah. Put wigs. Like, so, yeah, first first granny wig. Um, I'd say the first time I've put, seen put wig. Filmer, Put For wigs Val on Kilmer the dogs. And drag. Yeah, Val, yeah. Val Kilmer and Drag, and they put wigs on the dogs. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So, uh, what else do we need to cover? Are there, um, uh, is there any uh, coulda, woulda, shoulda? I have one. I have one. And it's, it's a big one, though. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. So, could have, would have, should it is where uh, George informs us about all the other actors and directors, anybody else who was considered for roles in this film, but didn't actually get them. So the only one I have for this is none other than John Cusack, not Joan Cusack. John Cusack tried out or tested out for the role of Mad Mardigan uh, and lost out to Val Kilmer. And according to IMDb, he considers it his biggest disappointment. So there you go. Well, missing out on it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's wow. hard to imagine uh, John Cusack. And I, I think he could definitely do it back then. Uh, but yeah, it's it's hard to imagine him having that same sort of cocky swagger as Val Kilmer does. No, I think he's, uh, I don't know. It's You forget how tall he is. You know, you see in... In uh, is it gross point blank when he's against Dan Aykroyd, who's not the tallest but not the shortest, you know? And then you see he's actually he's of a, he's quite sizable. So yeah, I, I could see him being formidable. But Val Kilmer is like six two or something, and it's just yeah. like you know. Yeah. So th- there you go. Um, that's Short all. Short but have. sweet. That's could it, would it, should it. Okay. Uh, any suspicious spin-offs that we need to be aware of? Isn't that the reason we're doing this? It's because of a suspicious spin-off. Well, before we get to that, there are actually uh, sequel books. So uh, George Lucas decided to continue on the Willow story after I don't think it performed as well as he imagined. He decided to yeah uh, carry on the story uh, in some novels. Uh, however, because he was busy with the the prequels in the sort of mid nineties, he got a writer called Chris Claremont, who was quite famous for writing uh, a lot of X Men comics. They got h- him to write it uh, instead. So he, I think, George Lucas provided the story, but then Chris Claremont would go on to actually write the novels. So they they're known as collectively as the Chronicles of the Shadow War. And there's Shadow Moon, Shadow Dawn, and Shadow Star, published in 95, 96, and year 2000. However, the books are generally disliked by the fans of the film due to their bleak tone and quick deaths of certain characters from the film. And apparently, George Lucas has since admitted he's not that happy with them and has effectively disowned them. Wow. So good to know about the spin offs of the books. Good. Nice try. Maybe try again. So yes, uh, the the reason we are doing this because we we we're, we're tapping into that top. What's topical? What's hot? Disney Plus 
are at the uh, round about the time you'll be listening to this podcast are releasing a sequel series called Willow, uh, uh, which f- picks up 20 odd years later. I think it's they haven't really released who what's about, but it's it's Willow and a band of of mixed sort of young misfits and uh Joanne Wally is appearing in it it already shows like how much of a leap between the 98 film and now just in terms of what you were talking about the Marvel thing in terms of the effects the scope the scale it looks really impressive and really makes the film look quaint in comparison and that's just based on the trailer Okay. What what's the word on the street? Is it going to be good? Because you know, we've had our hands burnt, we've had some good, we've had some bad. I was talking to somebody the other day that um I, I don't know where you're at with the Lord of the Rings new stuff on Amazon, but I haven't watched it. Apparently it gets better, but by episode three I was bored and I did just made me want to go back and watch uh, the Peter Jackson ones, but the word on the street is there's an entirely new generation who haven't seen the Peter Jackson ones who love streaming who are lapping it up. So, well, I have I haven't heard a, a single person endorse it. I've heard a couple of people say uh, it's okay, um, but I haven't heard anyone rave about it. The the the, the rings of power. You know, talking about why did why should you do these series? It's like I didn't get into Game of Thrones. I don't get House of the Dragon seems at a stretch, but like the fans of Game of the Thrones are watching it, you know. So well, no, that's it. I had a friend at work that was watching both Rings of Power and House of the Dragon. They said House of the Dragon is amazing. You know, it's really well done. And even if you don't like or haven't seen any of the other Game of Thrones, it's it's really good. But yeah, I think with getting back to Willow, I think it's a bit of an odd one, like that now. How many years later is it? You know, it's, it's thirty odd years later. Is there going to be? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like Star Wars, where there is that established audience. We may be wrong. There may be a lot of you know people that have be, have rediscovered it through Disney. But it seemed like I think when Disney Plus first came out, it was one of the first things they announced that they were going to bring back. Was yeah, we're doing more Star Wars. We're also going to do a Willow series. Well, they're obviously looking, they obviously bought the entire ranch in terms of Lucas's backstory and like, yep, we can make a series out of that. That's very Disney. That's very Disney. That's very Disney. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, as I say, um, in, in this, it does it does look like they're looking to branch out because it's a, a whole band of characters. It's not just Willow and somebody else. It looks like they're, they're making it more of a, an ensemble of of oh God, say, yeah. you, you yeah. can't make a series now without having three different you know stories. you got to have all you got to have all this all the subplots going on there is a story of a child destined to be an empress and the unlikely hero who would protect her There is a balance between all things. Light and shadow. Good and evil. When that balance is upset, the universe corrects. needs you again it needs your magic into the unknown that's where we must go so uh it looks impressive but I, I think I'm looking at it probably from the wrong way. I'm looking at the opportunity, you know, the opportunity Disney are taking with old uh, assets. But you're saying that that was like their plan all the way back in 2020 when they launched Disney Plus. They were like, "This is what it's about." So fair play to them. Yeah, I think I think there has been sort of rumors and plans, uh, you know, discussions of making a sequel uh, over the years. And Ron, Ron Howard sort of like said, "Oh yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, you know, ideas have come up, but not not just now." But you're right, you know, looking looking at that trailer, 
it does feel like there is a little bit of Disney saying we need our own Lord of the Rings, we need our own Game of yeah, Thrones. And we've got How- this Lucas asset that we bought when he when we bought all of his stuff off him. Yeah, let's let's, let's put it to use. Like, why do, should we should we make a new one to compete with Lord of the Rings? It's like what have we got in our back pocket? Well, we've got Willow. We're doing yeah. it. We're doing it. Yeah, but it does look quite you know some impressive production values. Some. Scope looks, and scale and stuff. Honestly, it looks more interesting. The fact that it's just got... I mean, nobody in Lord of the Rings has any connection to... It's just weird, that 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 concept. The fact that because it's been done by somebody different, they haven't got anybody... I mean, I haven't watched enough of it. Maybe other people come back. But apart from the orcs... <laughs> and and Galadriel, like, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not yeah. the same actress. There's no yeah. connection. It's like, yeah, they've got names, and but there's like, yeah, there's they've got names and species. that Anyway, so at least with this, you look at, you know, Willow, you're like, yeah, well, okay, they've got Warwick. They've got him in it. You know, they've got, that's enough. Yeah. I'm they've got, board. they've got uh, Kevin Pollock as, as, as returning as a brownie, uh, one yeah. of the brownies anyway. So do you know what I mean? They've got enough to like, okay, yeah, let's, let's yeah. take a look. Um it it probably will in three episodes end up being better than the film in terms of production values and the you know the amount of writers who work on it. Mm. So why not? So we can't, I'm not I'm yeah not criticizing them. It's just and, uh, the whole Luke, Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm. I know. I, th- I think that's the thing. Oh. I would I would actually say is that I think whilst Willow's an enjoyable film, I think it's it's not a perfect film. I think it's, you know, it's, it's perfectly enjoyable, but it's not a stone cold classic. So if anything, I think the series is in, there may not be too much yep. expectation and, in, you know, if anything, it, it, but it could potentially lead to, you know, Oh God, yeah, great. be successful. And I'm not sure how successful uh, the rings of power has been. There's considering been- how much did they pour into it? It's like, was not half a billion or something? I heard silly numbers. Yeah, like hundreds of hundreds of men. Well, they're the having to make a a, a second a season already to justify the amount of money they've spent on it. Give us a give them a second series, you swine. Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, okay, no, I mean I, I'm willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. See what it's like when it comes out. If I like it, I like it. I just think there's more interesting stuff to come because we, you know, we're, we're sort of beyond, I'd like to think the COVID lag, you know, in terms of creative stuff that's been made. I think there's some very interesting stuff coming out. I'm interested to see the new uh, Black Panther film just to see how they're doing with it. But I'm also quite cynical about the fact they're doing it after what happened with Chadwick Boseman. It's like, we need another film regardless of him dying. It's like, it's what he would have wanted. Anyway, um, but there's some great stuff. We've got John Wick coming, and I'm more excited in terms of Prime stuff, you know, talking about Rings of Power. I'd be more interested to see, like, the new Reacher, because they just wrapped a few weeks ago, so there's more Reacher. New Reacher, new Jack Ryan. You, As you said the other week, all of the airport dads. Dad fiction. <laughs> yeah absolutely okay so um all right well no i mean it was fun to go back i did reminisce and made me a little nostalgic i remember the film being a big being a memorable film a remarkable film from when we were younger so it definitely qualifies to be covered on retro ramble if you've not watched it in a while i guess your kids marty something got to be done about your kids i guess kids could like this maybe yeah i don't know i think i tried it too weird (laughs) Yeah, well, it's a bit, it's a bit obviously it's a little bit scary in places. You've got scenes obviously... of mild peril, as you would yeah. normally describe it. Yeah, you know, you've got the two headed monster, you've got the the trolls, the the pigs, and stuff like that. So there are a few like dogs. creepy things in dogs. it. The, dogs. The, the, the hairy dogs. <laughs> oh god, yeah, no, there's the bit where they all get turned into pigs. Oh my god, yeah, what a nut! No, no, that's a totally trippy. Like, sorry. So just before we move off Willow completely. Tell me about the parties, Mr. Howard. Tell me about the wild, wild parties that were had. So, so yeah, the only clip I could find on, on IMDb around this film, on the main Willow page, is like, oh, Ron Howard reminisces talking about working on Willow. And he just talks about all the, like, sex parties the little people had when they were filming all the village scenes. He said he walks past a... A Volkswagen, and there was multiple people in it all banging away. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so we're going to bring all of 
all of my community, all the little people together, and we're going to shoot a film. It's going to be lot- great. What else can we expect? Lots of. <laughs> they're, they're very, very <laughs> horny. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd be interesting to see the spike in viewing of Willow on Disney Plus of people saying, oh, the series has come out. I want to f- familiarize myself with it or people watching the new series and then say, oh, let's go back and, and watch it. You and all of Disney. Exactly. <laughs> Crossing their fingers. I hope it's going to be a success. Mm. Just need another hit. Um, OK, great. Well, that was that was Ron Howard and George Lucas's Willow from 1988. That was Retro Ramble. George, what can people expect coming up? We're getting very close to Christmas. That's right, Theo. It's a time of miracles. Uh, No, we're not doing Die Hard again. We're going to do a a Christmas classic, a McGee family favourite. We're going to do National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Looking very much forward to that. Have we got anything else exciting to mention is it too soon should we should we mention it no no i I think let's keep a lid on that we have an exciting announcement coming up around the end of the year is all we can say Uh, in terms of guests that might feature i think that's probably enough said in other news so we have our, our patreon channel is still going strong by the time you'll be listening to this We've done another Retro Ramble Revelations. So that's when Charlie and I review a film that we never saw growing up. So this time we are watching the action classic, question mark, (laughs) showdown in Little Tokyo with Dolph Lundgren and the late, great departed Brandon Lee. We talked about Brandon Lee last month in our Crow episode. And off the back of that, Charlie and I were intrigued to check out some of his other works. So there will be, there's plenty of stuff on our Patreon channel. So if you are not a subscriber, you know, please check it out. There's there's lots of content on Bond. We've been doing a lot of celebration being 60 years of James Bond. There's, I say, there's all the Revelation series. So there's stuff like The Warriors, a Roadhouse, Jean-Claude Van Damme's Cyborg. Oh my uh, God. As well as uh, recent releases. And as Charlie's saying, you know, there's some some big films coming out, the cinema coming up. uh, So there'll probably be some recent rambles as well. Uh, We'll probably be taking a a look back at the John Wick series with the release of John Wick 4 and plenty more. So, yeah, check out our our retro ramble uh, page on Patreon. Excellent. And obviously you can follow the blog on retroramble.blog. And we're on all the social media channels. So for this episode, I've been Charlie McGee. I've been George McGee. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Willow. Willow.